Today, we are talking to Dr. Mark Abel, Associate Professor in the University of Georgia College of Public Health and a family physician. He has recently done a meta-analysis looking at patient expectations and the realities of the length that people should suffer from acute bronchitis. Dr. Abel, can you tell us a little bit about what that research revealed? Sure. We did a, 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 a survey of um, people in the state of Georgia, a random sample of about 500 people, and we asked them, you know, given a scenario of an acute bronchitis illness, uh, maybe they had some green phlegm and maybe they had some fever, uh, how long would they expect that to last from beginning to end? And they said about uh, seven to nine days on average. And then we looked at the world's literature and tried to identify the studies that best answered that question, and we found uh, a bunch of studies that tracked how long people with an acute bronchitis or cough illness actually had symptoms. Symptoms. And it turned out that the average was much longer. It was 18 days. And we thought that was a really interesting finding and may explain why people sometimes uh, seek an antibiotic when it's a viral illness and, and they you know, would probably uh, not benefit from taking that antibiotic. What is the problem with people seeking antibiotics? Well, there, there are a number of things. Uh, one is that uh, increasingly people are being given very broad spectrum antibiotics. Uh, you might be familiar with the uh, Zithromax or the pack or Leviquin, and they're being given these for bronchitis, which is usually a viral illness, and viruses aren't killed by antibiotics. So it's not going to work. They're expensive, and they can cause resistance so that the next time someone gets sick or when a family member gets very sick with a pneumonia, that antibiotic may not work for them uh, because the bacteria have figured out how to uh, evade it. Um, and th there's just a larger issue of um, medicalizing an illness that's otherwise self-limited, something that's going to get better on itself or on its own with um, just over-the-counter treatment that isn't going to benefit from seeing a doctor necessarily or getting an antibiotic. And then finally, um, side effects. Um, there are some minor side effects like nausea and vomiting and diarrhea that happen to about 1 in 10 people who get one of these antibiotics. And there are very serious infections, one called C. difficile, that can put people in the hospital and cause a very serious illness. So, you know, we have to be thoughtful about using medications only when they're needed. What is one way that we can stop people from seeking these antibiotics? Well, I think education is a big part of it, and that's what I would hope uh, might be the next step, is that as we educate the public about uh, what to expect when they get sick, people realize that if they have a cough um, and they don't have any uh, signs of a serious illness like shortness of breath or difficulty breathing or coughing up blood or something like that, that um, they should give it a little time. They should be patient with it, use over-the-counter cough medicine if they want to, maybe take uh, medication to treat the fever or body aches, but uh, give it a little more time that, you know, four or five days, you should still expect to be coughing. Hopefully by uh, eight to 10 days, you might start to be feeling better. On average, it's going to last uh, a little over two weeks. Now, you're currently working on a project um, to educate consumers and patients who may be at risk. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, what we're interested in doing is developing a website that'll bring in data from the CDC, which has information on what illnesses are going around your community, uh, possibly also linking to sources like Google Flu Trends, linking that to information about your symptoms and kind of an intelligent algorithm that'll help decide, you know, are you likely to have bronchitis? Are you likely to have the flu? Are you likely to have sore throat or strep throat? And then linking that to advice about who ought to probably seek care, for whom is it more optional, and who can probably stay home and manage their illness themselves. And we hope that that will get the right people in sooner to see the doctor, because that's another issue. You don't want people staying home if they do have something more serious. And then help um, those who don't have to see the doctor get good advice about what they can do for themselves. Now, you brought up the flu, and now is probably a good time to talk just a little bit about that. And can you offer any advice on how to avoid contracting the flu? Stay away from people. <laughs> I think that's not a lot you can do. And, and it's um, one of the problems with the flu is the first 
24 hours that you get it, you feel fine, but you're spreading the virus to other people. So it's not always the person on the bus or in the restaurant who's coughing and sneezing. It could be somebody who has no symptoms at all. So we call that social distancing, uh, hand washing, uh, you know, paying attention to your hygiene. It's tough, though. Everybody touches their face multiple times a day. You touch a doorknob. Three minutes later, you touch your face. You can transfer flu virus that way. The best thing is really to get the flu shot um, early in the season. Uh, that provides some protection. Even if you still get the flu, it may reduce the intensity of the flu symptoms. Um, and so I you know, would encourage folks to do that. And it's not too late to get the flu shot if you can still find it. I've heard that people can take Tamiflu as a way to combat the virus once they've contracted it. What do you think? Well, the Tamiflu, uh, we just did a, a meta-analysis. We found 11 studies on Tamiflu, and it turned out only three had been published. And those were the ones that were probably the most favorable toward the drug. The other eight studies, when we looked at those data all together, we found that there probably is some benefit. You get better about 30 hours faster if you get it in the first 24 hours. Between 24 and 36 hours, you get about 14 hours less symptoms. Beyond 36 hours, there's really no benefit. What we also found was that it didn't reduce the likelihood of hospitalization, and it didn't reduce the likelihood of uh, having a complication significantly. So I think we have to be uh, thoughtful about how we use it. It's reasonable to use it in the first 24, maybe 36 hours, but uh, after a couple of days, it's just not going to help you no matter how much you want it to. So why were the other studies not published? Well, that's for the manufacturer to answer, but um, in some cases they didn't find any benefit. And, and I think I'm concerned about that because um, one of the studies was in vulnerable, uh, two of the studies were actually in vulnerable populations. One was in older adults and one was in those with chronic heart and lung disease. And neither one found a significant benefit. And the other third study was the largest ever done and didn't find, was the one that looked at 0 to 24 hours between 24 and 36, and didn't find much benefit in that 24 to 36 group. And that's when a lot of patients come in to see the doctor, and I think they probably weren't anxious for that information to get out as well. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Abel. Today we've been chatting with Dr. Mark Abel, Associate Professor in the College of Public Health at the University of Georgia.